my first memories are of going to the Justice Department at the height of the Civil Rights Movement when my father was the Attorney General. And um, after one of those visits, he had a very good sense of humor. He said, uh, he wrote me a letter, which I have on my wall today, and it says, Dear Kerry, today was a historic day, not just because of your visit, <laughs> but, but because two African Americans were allowed to register at the University of Mississippi. It happened just a few moments ago, and I hope these events are long past by the time you get your pretty little head to college. <laughs> Love and kisses, Daddy. Well, a lot of changes have happened in, in those intervening years. Um, uh, and it's, it's hard to relay the degree of oppression faced by African Americans when he wrote those words. Um, at the time, across the South, African Americans were prevented from voting. They could not sit at a lunch counter with, with their white counterparts um, or drink from the same water fountains. Effectively, they could not own a business or send their children to university. They couldn't swim in public schools or buy a house in the neighborhood of their choice. In 1955, Emmett Till was murdered at the age of 14 for flirting with a white woman. The Ku Klux Klan was in power and counted police, sheriffs, and elected officials among its leaders. The Freedom Riders bus was bombed. In 1961, an angry white mob of 3,000 hurled racial epithets and bricks and were barely stopped from burning down First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, where Martin Luther King and 600 African Americans sought refuge. In 1963, John Lewis led 600 civil rights demonstrators across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama to demonstrate on behalf of voting rights. Alabama Governor George Wallace ordered state and local police to stop the march on grounds of public safety. The group was confronted by authorities armed with billy clubs and tear gas, which made people sick to their stomachs in what infamously became known as Bloody Sunday. In the face of that violence and hatred, Martin Luther King called for nonviolent resistance and protest. He was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, and he in turn inspired and continues to inspire human rights movements around the world. So today we are joined by three leaders of those movements. Um, Rita Alfardan, is a key member of the Bahrain Watch, an independent research and advocacy organization that aims to promote effective and transparent governance in Bahrain. Following the February 2011 uprising, the Bahraini government claimed it had instituted human rights and democratic reforms. In response, Bahrain Watch, formed in February 2012, sought to investigate those claims by providing a web platform that collates publicly available evidence and presents it to the public. Over the last year, its goals have expanded to include research and advocacy on all forms of governance in Bahrain, including political reform, economic development, and security. Reda is the software developer be behind the Bahrain map an Android app that users can use to find the location of protests, checkpoints, blocked roads, police movements, or anything else they are searching for in real time using crowdsourced data from Twitter. Kaspar Zalitas is a human rights activist and a board member of the LGBTI NGO Mazeka, um, the only functioning gay rights organization in Latvia. <coughs> Mosaica combats hate crimes and protects LGBTI rights throughout the country. Kaspars was, um, uh, has emerged as one of Latvia's most prominent LGBTI activists. Kaspars joined Mosaica as a founding member in 2006. Since then, he has represented the organization at countless international events with the Amnesty International, Interbride conferences, and pride parades all around the world. Earlier this year, a number of Americans, outraged by state-sponsored homophobia in Russia, called for a boycott of Stolichnaya vodka. Kaspers made headlines after writing an open letter suggesting that Americans behind the vodka boycott reconsider their campaign, as Stoli is made in Latvia, not Russia. <laughs> the importance of research. <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, Eli Wolf. Eli Wolf is the director of the Inclusive Sports Initiative at the Institute for Human Centered Design. ISI ensures that people with disabilities can become integral members of the sporting community. Eli also directs the Sports and Development Project at Brown University, where I graduated, which advances sports and social change on a local and global scale. Eli has a, built a career on advocating for athletes with disabilities. From 2004 to 2006, he led an effort to include provisions addressing sports and recreation within the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Eli established, helped to establish the ESPY Award for Best Male and Female Athlete with a Disability. He also organized the National Disability Sport Organization to support professional golfer Casey Martin in his successful case against the PGA before the US Supreme Court. Eli was a member of the United States Paralympics soccer team in the 1996 and 2004 Paralympic Games. He, he was also a member of the national team from 1995 to 2004 and complete, competed in several Pan American Games and World Championships. So, um, without further ado, we have actually a short film on Bahrain. Please watch. Silent movie. <laughs> yeah. So maybe should we start? Yeah. Okay. Oh. We'll start, and we're going to come back to that film. Um, but why don't we start with you? Um, so tell us about the you. You were just talking a few minutes ago about the impact of Martin Luther King on Bahrain, and that sort of sense of um, of a history of violent protests that suddenly a few years ago um, turned nonviolent. So why don't, you, why don't you talk to us about that? Okay, so um, uh, I think just to give context to those who don't know much about Bahrain because it's not always the top thing considering it's a very small island in the Gulf with just about a million people out of its population. Um, uh, we've in Bahrain's history, um, it's, uh, people have been calling for democratic uh, rights for over 100 years now, since British colonization, uh, after the British left, when the Americans came. Uh, so we've always been uh, striving to get more rights uh, uh, for ourselves as a people. And traditionally, every 10 years, there's a big uprising in Bahrain, which is repressed and cracked down by force. Uh, and, and what happened, uh, I mean, the last, for example, the last uprising that I grew up in was in the 90s. And you had youths and people coming out in the street protesting, and then the government sends their uh, mercenaries, you know, from all over the world, basically, to crack down and kill and torture. And, you know, the, the political leaders are either killed or put in exile. And what happened in 2012 after the Arab uprisings is that there was a big shift towards nonviolence. Now, the reason behind this was the movie that was going to be shown was for, uh, 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 let's say, Al-Khawaja family. So there's Abdel Hadi Al-Khawaja, who's a, uh, uh, a very well-known uh, human rights defender who worked in different regions around the world. He's a Bahraini, and he, when he came back from exile in the 2000s, uh, this was a period when the previous emir died, and due to the uprising in the 90s, the new king, which is the current king, uh, said, I will make peace with the people, and I will reinstitute the parliament that was only functioning for two years in the 70s. I will give it back to the people while we become a constitutional monarchy. And I will release all political prisoners, while basically giving impunity to all torturers previously as well, and uh, constitute uh, a new era for the country. That era took 10 years. Abdul Hadi Khawaja came back in those 10 years, and he started teaching uh, these protesters, especially the youth, nonviolent tactics. 
he was an actual believer in nonviolence, where he was telling them that these policemen who are shooting at you, they are human beings as well. Uh, talking to them, tell, uh, you know, as equal people. Uh, not everybody, you know, buys that very quickly. But over about five years of his work, where he showed them, he told them, go to the police stations when you ask for your kids to see them, because usually they put them in prison and won't show, show the families their kids up until like months later. And he said, get beaten up and just put, put your hands there. So he's using those kind of tactics from the nonviolent movement here in the, in the US. And uh, he, he himself showed it by example. He went and he got beaten up and he got tortured. And Zainab al-Khawaja, who's his daughter, who's also uh, now in prison, I, I forgot to mention that currently right now, after 2011, he's serving a life sentence. Uh, basically for calling for, uh, I mean, as they call it, basically for calling for regime change. Uh, for him, he was calling for obviously, you know, uh, basic human rights for the people. And for him, when he was put in prison, his torturers, apart from picking him up in the middle of the night from his home and torturing him and beating up his family uh, in front of him, they tortured him and sexually assaulted him and he did it by example. He is a real believer in, in nonviolence. He did not hit back. The only way for him when they were trying to sexually assault him is that he hit his head on the floor so much he broke his jaw. And then they stopped, obviously, because he, he was, that's, that, his, that was his way of basically you know, preventing more violence against him, was to not hit back, but I'll hit myself. And that's why it was a dramatic scene for obviously for the torturers in the prison. And he was rushed into hospital and he had a lot of uh, operations on his jaw. And there were pictures of him with a very, you know, uh, horrendous kind of, you know, sight. So he, he was a real teacher of nonviolence. People for the five years he was there, some believed in it, some used it as a tactic. But when 2011 came with the Arab uprising, the uh, protesters that were used to basically going and protesting, cutting off streets with burning tires and throwing Molotov cocktails to uh, uh, put out uh, policemen from coming in the villages, they just left the tires. They left the Molotov cocktails. They actually believed in nonviolence for about that year, basically, for the, for, uh, actually for about two months, February and March, before the Saudi military came into the country. And the reason, the reason why is that people saw that this nonviolent movement actually worked. It actually put the government under so much pressure that the king comes out on TV and apologizes for the death of protesters for the first time in, in our history, really. I mean, we never, ever got an apology. Mm -hmm. And he never admitted fully, but he apologized for two, for two deaths. So they saw that nonviolence worked for a very short while. The problem why after now, nearly now three years now, uh, the burning of tires and the Molotov cocktails by youth is coming back is that they saw the whole world that was giving them so much attention for a very short time has basically forgotten about them. Mm -hmm. And the government has no more pressure. The US still sells the, uh, sells, you know, the government you know, tanks and fighter jets and the military you know, all there. So what they saw, and if you look at Martin, uh, Martin Luther King here in, in the US, his nonviolent movement, part of its success was because he was in contact with the president, with President Kennedy at the time. And there was some movement, there was some reception from the federal government mm -hmm. to the movement that he was doing there. For us, there's no federal government. Mm -hmm. We're a small country in a GCC where Saudi Arabia and all the other governments do not want Democ to see democracy in there. And for us, we only have the world, have the UN, you know, other kind of, you know, world Western powers and stuff to, you know, come and actually to act like the federal government when Martin Luther King, you know, basically had the school children for integration, they can send the army for, for the federal government. Here, it was the opposite. We had armies being sent to crush us, yes. not to support us. Mm. And, uh, that, and, that's the, and that's the disappointment, basically, where in, in the US, we had so much support from human rights first and activists all over. Where, but the US government, for us, we see it as it does not honor its own history of civil rights movement, even with Obama being the president there. It does not honor it. 
So the U.S. government was a disappointment to you. Mm -hmm. It is a it's a disappointment for all the people who were there in Bahrain because mm -hmm. because of the rhetoric, because we thought actually that they would understand they would understand in Bahrain that you have a, a minority rule a tribe you know that has been ruling the country for two hundred years and a, and a majority that's been basically has the same history of working as serfs for the for for the regime like slavery here. Uh, calling for the same kind of you know, rights and equality. Uh, there's so many similarities. They, they thought they were going to be understood. But in the end, the military you know, uh, kind of uh, solution was supreme. Uh, and uh, you know, the kind of the small time of attention has gone away. So I mean, that's the kind of thing why you see there are still the, op the main opposition is still holding on to nonviolence as a tactic. Unlike Abdel Hadi Khawaja, who held on to nonviolence and Martin Luther King's teachings as a philosophy, as a spiritual belief, mm -hmm. uh, which did work with the people, because uh, as I was saying, there was actually a protest from the Lulu roundabout, which was the main Tahrir Square in Bahrain, to the royal court. And people there, the leaders of the movement there, told the people, those who believe in nonviolence, come to this protest. Those who don't have enough patience to not hit back, to not take any rocks, don't come. And I remember one of the other leaders who was also serving a life sentence as well, Abdul Wahab Hussain. He brought a verse from the Quran which tells the biblical story of Cain and Abel, where Cain was going to kill Abel, and Abel was telling him, if you're going to stretch your arm to kill me, I will not stretch my arm to kill you. And hence, uh, I get the sin of both of us. So that was very powerful to the people there. Some people went with coffins and walked and got beaten up. We got shot at with, uh, with the bird shots and pellets and tear gas. And nobody, nobody the, you know, brought any Molotov cocktails or tires. People believed that that would work. And they did not need any you know, extensive history lessons or anything like that. They just believed in it. Uh, but it's, 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 this is what we want. We want you know, the world to act like the federal government acted here in the U.S. to the civil rights movement. Thank you. Thank you for that. Casper, um, how, uh, how do you see the civil rights movement in, in your work on LGBTI rights, and how would you relate that to what's going on with Bahrain? Yeah, it was... Um I was just thinking about the nonviolent actions. As, uh, yeah, Latvia was 50 years under the Soviet Union, so it's for, for us as some, something as to go out to do any action is something uh, not acceptable in the society still. Like we're more than 23 years out of the Soviet Union, but still people don't think that we should go out at all. We should act at all. So, the LGBT people were actually the first that came out uh, with a pride um, and said, like, let's stop. Uh, let's stop all the actions against us. Let's stop the discrimination that happens. Let's stop the beating up. And this would have been as well inspired by the Martin Luther King when, when he responded on this as like, why, why should, like, you, sh you can negotiate. It's like, why are, you, why are you doing these actions? Why are you doing sit-ins? And after 2005, when we organized the first Pride, we responded to this. We did not exist be uh, before 2005. There were no gay people in the society. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and suddenly, after 2005, there were negotiations. It's obviously, we started as like they tried to calm us down. Now we how many years are now? I can't even remember. Eight years after that, um, they are negotiating with us in order to make the situation better. And uh, yeah, it's like I, I kind of have a lot of parallels because in 2006, people were sh uh, throwing excrements at us. We kept on marching. We smiled. We never uh, said people were spitting at us. We kept on marching. We, sing, uh, we were singing the songs and marching while people were screaming at us, while police hated us. But it's like these things happen and we, we never believed that any violence would uh, do anything good. So it's, it's some, something that inspires us to, to kind of 
this nonviolent action is kind of to move us forward. But, but were, were people taught to be nonviolent? Because that's what, that was a big part of the civil rights movement. There was a lot of training beforehand. Um, and it, it wasn't that people just suddenly were nonviolent on the streets. There was, was there training? Was there yeah, an I, understanding of it? Was, did you talk about it before you went out? We, we talked uh, within the, the organization that we should go out. We should be, uh, should be nonviolent. We, uh, we should smile when people are hating us. We, uh, we should call for our rights. Even people are throwing stones at us. So we decided this path, uh, to follow this path, uh, brother. And was there a debate about that? Did some people say, hell no? Oh, Is yes. Beating you up. Yes. <laughs> Fight uh, back. It's like we should, we should take a stone and throw the same stone back. And we said, in no way. We're never going and argue with those uh, homophobes that are uh, throwing excrements at us. Uh, it's, it's like we don't need to argue with you because we don't need to respond with a hate to you. The only thing that we can respond is with a smile. We, uh, we can respond with a, as we were saying, with a love. So let's, let's respond with, uh, to hate with love. So, so that, that's, uh, that's how we developed. It's the same uh, when we started to work with the uh, police officers. Police officers hate, uh, hate us and they still hate us. At every training that we give to them, they call me a faggot. I said, thank you for that. It's like, it's not probably the first time when I hear this, but let's now, uh, continue our work and let's try How to get... How is it that you're doing training with police officers? Uh, you know, Latvia want to be a little progressive and actually that's... Uh, I heard uh, I heard the first panel and it kind of inspired us but um, and I wanted to say a good thing actually the US Embassy were one of the one of the biggest supporters for the LGBT rights and uh, actually US Embassy in Riga we're supporting these trainings uh, People from embassy came over and to spoke about the history of U.S. on working uh, with the police officers and the civil rights movement, and uh, this is this is how it it all started. And they still call me in names, and I say, okay, let's just move forward. It's you know, we believe to human rights. You believe to human rights. I believe to human rights. You probably don't think it's the same thing, not just yet. Uh -huh. Let's wait for some time, but 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 it's. It's a thing that we have to, we have to move forward. And I suppose uh, that the ideas of the Martin Luther King, and as well the ideas that uh, that the civil rights movement uh, kind of created over here, it's uh, we bring home and and uh, we implement there. So and it, and not just uh, not just what happened to the Afro Afro Americans over here as well. That happened with the Stonewall riots. Uh, it, it happened there and we're still marching. It's, uh, you, you see all over the Central Eastern Europe, it's still a struggle. It's uh, when we, we can go 40 years back in US, it's still nowadays, it's to d today in the Central Eastern Europe, but we're following the, the path that actually started over here. So, and we hope that one day we could actually, a lot of people don't believe that pride matters in US. Oh, you can't even imagine how much it matters in our countries because we really want to go because people restrict us to march and they fight so we can't march and we, but we try to march, we follow the law. Uh, if you allow us to march, we're gonna uh, we're gonna march. If you're gonna restrict, we will find a way how to express our views. Mm -hmm. uh, but most important as well, we never respond to violence with a violence. Uh, thank you for that. So we've heard about Bahrain and Latvia, but you will also you're uh, uh, an American, and you're fighting for rights here in the U.S. Um, so. Talk about how the civil rights movement inspired the disability rights movement. I guess for, I guess for me, I don't know if the mic is on. It doesn't sound like it. Um, I can try to talk loudly. You guys can hear. Um, I guess for me, the, the, the reason why I was very much compelled, speak, here we go. It's called adaptation. <laughs> it's inclusion at its best. <laughs> For me, 
when I was in, um, just when I was reading about civil rights and, uh, and learning about civil rights, particularly within the sports world, because um, I was very interested in kind of the sports culture as an athlete, but all the books that I read as a college student, high school and so forth, there was not a single mention of people with disabilities. There was not a single chapter, there was not a single line, there was nothing in the whole book about people with disabilities and the sports relationship to sports. But there was lots of civil rights discussion about um, Jackie Robinson, the Negro Leagues, um, 1968, um, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. There were many um, parallels between um, you know, African Americans and then also globally with regard to South, A South Africa and apartheid and the Olympic policy of, of banning countries that had apartheid practices. Um, and so for me, the light bulb went off and I really started to think through that there's many parallels between race, gender, disability, and you know, sexual orientation as well, that there is such a commonality, but for some reason disability wasn't being thought of in that way as a civil rights issue, as a human rights issue, particularly within a sports context. And um, so I, I just remember th with several colleagues, we were like, how can we begin to, you know, not only write about these things, but also advocate and educate. Um, and so at the chance with the United Nations and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that was worked on from 2003 to 2006 and then through 2008, um, the opportunity to actually be a part of integrating the element of, of sport, recreation, physical activity, and play as part of the broader disability rights discourse, but also to think about how the right to sport and play um, transcends not only for people with disabilities, but also as it relates to um, other groups. So particularly um, taking the Convention on, Against Apartheid in Sports. So the United Nations already had some precedent for thinking about the right to sport. And so for me, this was very inspiring and an opportunity to really think through how can disability be elevated and how can people with disabilities begin to be seen within this civil rights and human rights paradigm and this framework. Um, and so for, for me and for my colleagues as we do this work around trying to put people with disabilities into the discourse of, of sport and civil rights and human rights, we're always strategically making these connections because oftentimes what we found is just to talk about disability on its own it's oftentimes much harder for people to make the connections to see that these are really civil rights and human rights issues to understand the history of what other groups have gone through. Um, for example, the, the Negro Leagues, which I referred to a moment ago, um, for baseball, um, there used to be a separate league. So a African Americans had a separate league called the Negro Leagues. And then there was an integration process of bringing um, the Af African Americans into Major League Baseball. And so similarly, you see that now with organizations um, very much a segregate many microphones <laughs> <laughs> you see that now with um, in some ways you could call it a segregated system as it is now the Paralympics and the Special Olympics in some ways you could actually see those systems of sport for people with disabilities as very much apartheid you could see that as, as segregated models and so to really think about how do we think through the transition and the empowerment of, of a rights-based approach for bringing people with disabilities into the fold as being valued, as being respected, as having dignity as athletes, as, as being able to compete, participate, play. It's not only about the elite level, it's just about, just as anyone with, the, with or without a disability to be able to do sport and to be active and to have that right to play, to be active, that people with disabilities are also within that realm. And so I guess from my perspective, the civil rights movement and the nonviolent aspects and the ability to think about it from an educational perspective and to really think through how sport has been a vehicle for the broader civil rights movement, I think it's been very powerful to see how sport can also help to transcend and help to engage within the disability context too. So it's, um, and I guess just on a final point, I feel that the intersectionality the, um, at a broader level, because as I've evolved in my work and my interests, 
I have seen that disability is really a lens. You know, disability is one view for thinking about um, human rights and sports, but it's also very much about this broader sport and human rights conversation. Um, and so I have seen myself and very much engaged in the broader realm of sport and human rights activities, whether it is continuing to look at LGBT rights or whether it's looking at gender equity in sport or if it's looking at um, you know, racial or religious equality. So across the board, um, I think that the sports realm has become very much an allied movement. So there is a sense of the inter you know, coming together and figuring out ways that we can support one another. I think that in our kind of movement and leadership through the CRPD, um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I've been overwhelmed by the amount of support that we've received from the other civil rights and human rights movements, that there's been a really sense of support that this arena of engagement in sport is not only important from a disability perspective, but also from a broader civil rights and human rights perspective. So why did you um, strategically decide to um, work on disabilities from the international human rights perspective instead of working domestically on changing laws in the United States? I guess the way that you know, my colleagues and I and the team that I have, um, we've, we approach at a sort of a systems level approach. So we do feel that we are engaging internationally, but also domestically here. We are, um, we're very involved with the, the recent um, Department of Education federal guidance that was issued with regard to um, opportunities for students with disabilities in the schools. So from, from kindergarten all the way through colleges and universities, that that has sort of been a big gap of opportunity. So there, there is activity of engagement at a US level, um, but I do think that that whole understanding of the global piece and having had that opportunity, um, actually Charlotte is in the room with USAID who was one of the you know, major leaders and, and a big source of inspiration for me in the work around the CRPD. Um, and so being able to understand that global impact, um, the one sort of message at a global level that the CRPD put forward was an understanding of nothing about us without us, um, which really means about being in positions of power, in positions of leadership, to be able to take that um, role, to be able to have um, a seat at the table. And I feel like that message is very much the case, not only internationally, but even here you know, domestically. The, the, my, my work right now with the Department of Education and the implementation of the federal guidance for the Rehab Act is specifically with the NCAA, so the National Collegiate Athletic Association. And there's not a single person within the NCAA that has a disability. Not a single person in leadership of any athletic department or any staff level, any um, athletic conference director, anything <laughs> that has a disability. So it's really interesting to try to influence a system like that. I guess for me, I've, I've, all, I've sort of found it um, very challenging but also compelling to try to work within sports because sports is in some ways somewhat exclusive. You know, sport has an element sometimes of thinking about being exclusive or, you know, you're setting who, get, who qualified, who doesn't. But so I think the challenge of trying to figure out that system and to create a way for it to be inclusive and to create opportunities for people with disabilities to still be respected and understood as athletes and having that cap cap capability it's really about having that potential, to have that tryout, to have that chance to be able to, to do what you want with your body and as an athlete. And so I think learning that from particularly um, the other civil rights and human rights movements has been very powerful. Thank you. Um, we're going to have time for some questions from the audience. So think about those questions. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll ask this. Taylor Branch talked about the importance of, um, of nonviolence in actually in creating change and, um, and specifically at, about getting a seat at the table. You know, when you're in a situation where you have no rights at all, how do you get to have those rights? And um, he said that, that nonviolence was center, central to that. And, and you're also talking about um, how do you establish rights when they're not there 
beforehand. Do you think about that in, in Bahrain? Is, and because you've had, there's been a, a big debate within the movement in Bahrain, whether to use nonviolence or whether to use violence. And it sounds like there was a short period when people agreed nonviolence was okay, but now they've gone back to violence. So how do you, yeah. how do you see that playing out? Well, I mean, as it, it's, it's not that, oh. <laughs> I'm getting echo, my voice is already loud. <laughs> okay, it's not that the whole of the people went back to violence, it's that in the short period, everyone was unified behind the nonviolence movement. Right now, the situation is that there's the formal opposition parties who lead mass protests, they still do, uh, which are safe, uh, you know, and nonviolent, and usually they end up, after the protest ends, police come and attack, and then there's like small youth who come, uh, like small groups who obviously respond, uh, you know, with uh, blocking roads and uh, violence. Um, and at the same time, uh, villagers as well, they try to protect their villages by keeping the police out, and the only way they know how to do it uh, is to put blocks on the road. Um, so, so the, the, the argument is still there, and actually, I wanted to ask Taylor, <laughs> uh, because w I don't know if he's still in the room. Oh, it's right there. Hello, <laughs> it's an honor to meet you. <laughs> I, this is one of the things, I don't know if you can give him the microphone, because this was my question oh, no. before, but I was, Taylor. I was dashed outside before I could ask. <laughs> Yes, we would like to. Yeah, no. That would be great. I was just tweeting about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you probably should come. Uh, but anyway, I, my question was actually, um, this, this is the thing I always think about. In the nonviolence movement in the US, uh, especially it was led by Reverend King. Uh, and it seemed to me, from my limited knowledge as well, that he had response from people in the federal government. There was some, the, the Kennedys, they were very supportive. Um, I don't know, in, in our situation, at some point we had that feeling. We had a feeling of support from higher powers that could put pressure on those segregationists, those who consider us below human in Bahrain. So they put pressure on them and hence it was much easier to like, you know, join the nonviolence movement and become more moral and spiritual about it. But when that support faded away and it went back to the old system where the military reigns supreme, we're still going to send our fighter jets. For us, after Bloody Thursday, which is the protesters were all gathered in the roundabout in tents where they were having fun, chatting, sleeping as a big sit-in for nonviolence and democracy. People were like making jokes about, you know, the movement and stuff and doing poems and everything. And then at 3 a.m., the, uh, the police and the military come in and shoot and kill seven people. And then the next day they deploy the military and the fighter jets go low on our houses and we think, you know what? These fighter jets are from the US, yeah? They keep saying that, I mean, and the tear gas canisters, everything, they're all sent from the U.S. And the U.S. preaches that we will support a revolution. We will try and always talk to those people in the regime because we honor our own civil rights movement, that it's a nonviolent, you know, movement. People thought that they would be understood. But it seems that in the U.S., I know that some people like you <laughs> and like many others that, you know, Brian and stuff who are very supportive, they support the Bahrain revolution on moral grounds. But it seems that the leaders who start up moral, they go up into office and their morality fades away. Um, Taylor, could I ask you to come and sit with us? <laughs> yeah, I was uh, <laughs> feeling awkward with keeping you. Have you with us? <laughs> you, you, you go sit here, that's all. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, but I enjoyed my panel, but I enjoyed this one too. This <laughs> is, in, in a quick answer to your question, what, what I would say is the movement took a long time. 
There were many moments of disillusionment. Every moment of disillusionment was a challenge to figure out how to make that the beginning of the next conversation and not the end, not the, not the surrender to despair, not to, to figure out what to do with it. Do we go talk to those policemen? Do we, do we, do we send out uh, Twitter messages to the whole world? Why are you ignoring us? You know, what do you do next? Because remember, the civil rights movement, Birmingham was nine years after the Brown decision that formally outlawed segregation and said it was incompatible with the U.S. Constitution. It took a long time. So those things are hard. And even, even Robert Kennedy, um, it, there was support, but Robert Kennedy was also frustrated with the movement. No, you're going to like this. You're going to like this. Robert Kennedy grew steadily interacting with the movement from a position of not knowing a lot about it but being sympathetic and then when he'd do something it would do harm to his brother then he'd get mad and he'd do something to try to throttle the movement and say back up then he'd feel bad about that and he got to know people through it and that was that was the process by which he became Robert Kennedy um, so these things don't happen overnight. There were many times when the, uh, the civil rights movement was frustrated with the Kennedy administration. But when uh, President Kennedy gave the speech, I think the night that your dad wrote that note, uh, that very night, that was the greatest moment. Um, that was really a pivotal moment when he defined the, mor the civil rights issue in moral terms uh, and said, you know, we are confronted with uh, primarily a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the U.S. Constitution. That was a great moment. But you have to remember, only months before that, at Ole Miss, the president gave a speech saying, I didn't have anything to do with this lawsuit. The judges were all Southerners. And, you know, you're integrating because you want to honor your, your football traditions. So he wasn't embracing the moral. So it was it, it's never a smooth thing, so I just want to, it's a long struggle, it's very profound, and people have to always adapt. Do you, do you, do you have a response to that? Yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, no, it's just very interesting um, just to hear these different perspectives, and I guess for me, one thing that I wanted to share, a little personal note, is that my grandfather was um, a part of um, Justice Earl Warren's, um, he was clerking for Justice Earl Warren during Brown vs. Board. And um, so I don't know exactly how that had an effect on me or, or whatnot, but I'm, I think it has <laughs> because of the way that I'm, you know, I, for me just these principles of, of justice and equality and being valued and what it means at a very visceral level to, to you know, what does that feel like to just be accepted and have that right to do, um, to achieve your, your to achieve what you want to achieve. And, um, you know, I guess for me to hear your presentation and, and the others and even the history of the, of the building of the Declaration of hu Human Rights, I mean, it's, it's all just very powerful. And then for me, from a disability standpoint, you know, it's, it's really interesting because sometimes I feel that even when we are talking about sport for all or inclusion or human rights, that sometimes disability is not even in that conversation. And so I think now it's starting to be, I think that there's more of an awareness of um, that people with disabilities are integral and central to our society. Um, but again, there's, there's moments in history, if you look back, of kind of the invisibility of disability, you know, where sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's invisible. And I guess some, the way that I like to think about inclusion is to go from being invisible in, a, in an excluded way to being invisible in an included way. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like if we're able to make that evolution in our society um, where people can just be, be themselves and be there without being labeled or being something, then I think that, and so all that you're talking about really speaks to that for me. Um, I just want to go back to, to your comment about, um, uh, about the President Kennedy's role in the Justice Department role in, in the civil rights movement and sort of the parallel today of what our obligation is in the international human rights movement to come to the aid of, um, of defenders, the Martin Luther Kings and Mahatma Gandhis of our time, who are up against their own governments 
and are looking for the international community to support them over the objections of their government. Um, you know, I think that President Kennedy was very sensitive to those issues, both domestically and internationally. And he stood up um, for, uh, for people across Africa who are shuffling off the, the coils of colonialism. He was um, the first senator to say that we should stand w with the Algerians against the French when they were trying to get independence. And again, in Egypt, he did that. And throughout, really throughout the Middle East as well, um, he thought that we shouldn't be aligning ourselves as the United States had traditionally done with the royalists, but we should be aligning ourselves with those who um, he felt represented the, the grassroots, uh, the people in throughout South America and in Asia um, and the Middle East as well. And um, well, can I say something else about my uncle? <laughs> <laughs> um, which is that, you know, most people think that the most dangerous thing that hap the the most dangerous problem we faced in the United States at that time was that there would be a war between uh, John Kennedy and Khrushchev, but that was wrong. The most dangerous parties were not Khrushchev and John Kennedy. Both of those men were committed to peace. The danger was the US CIA and the US Pentagon, who were constantly trying to find a way to have a hot war with Russia. And John Kennedy spent his entire presidency trying to stop them. And one example of this is Mississippi, when he, um, at the end of 1963, there were 16,000 advisors in Vietnam. Advisors, no ground troops but he had sent 20,000 ground troops to Mississippi to integrate the university there. And after the Bay of Pigs, he said, I wish we could take the CIA and cut it into 1,000 pieces and blow it to the wind. So, um, you know, he was sensitive to these issues. And in Haiti, the word for coat is Kennedy. And in, um, in Morocco, the word for milk is Kennedy. And in Lebanon, the word for bombs is Bush. So, you know, I think these things make a difference. And I think it really does make a difference when you look up in the sky and you say, well, the United States is supposed to be with us, but there are US planes that are dropping bombs on our people. So, um, do we have questions? Uh, how should we do this? Can, okay, please. Hi, uh, my name is Mora Onyonka, and I am a recent law graduate. And my question for all of you is, beyond looking at education, as Alita and also Eli mentioned earlier, how do we reach, inspire, and then motivate young activists to essentially mobilize? You know, is it tweeting as Taylor was doing it? Is it um, making activism more sexy by having internet campaigns? What tools and mechanisms have all of you found in both Bahrain and, you know, within the, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of your institution, um, and also with your Gay Alliance group, like what tools and mechanisms do you find that you're able to employ? Good. Thank you, Star. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. I think internet is cool, uh, and we can, uh, yeah, we we can use uh, Twitter, Facebook, and this is how we engage with uh, some of the people. But I am, in a way, very conservative as well. Uh, I think we need we need to talk to people. We need to inspire them on the ground. We need to go and meet them, and just take their hands and and show how to do activism. Uh, it's, uh, I, I was telling that to Brian before, uh, I consider myself as a professional gay. So if somebody ever needs in Latvia to see a gay person, I just go and shake a hand. Hello, I'm probably the first. So, and, and this is, this, and in Latvia this is happens, oh my God, you're the first gay person and you're okay. It's like you're not sick or something like that. So, okay, we can do something together. So this is uh, a lot of times we, we need internet to 
kind of get together, get masses, but in order to get the true activists, we need to go and meet them and inspire them and talk to them. So this, this is, this is my, uh, my thing, because, yeah. It's like, this is how we got those people who, we are marching, we're working on an everyday basis. We, we just go and we take their hands uh, with us. And we tell the stories of those people who, who cannot tell their stories. For example, in the same time we were talking about our old people in Latvia. We don't have old activists because they're still afraid to go out. We are, we young people, we give their message out and we need to do that because some of those um, LGBT people that were in the Soviet Union, uh, we just brought, we just published a book in English about uh, homosexuals in the Soviet Union. There were many stories about that we did not include because those people who gave interviews, they're still afraid that somebody is going to come and pick them up and lock in a prison or lock in a mental hospital. And this is what the young people have to do. And, and yeah, so we just need to take their hand and, and just do activism. So internet is cool, but the private... Rita? Yeah. Um, well, the Bahrain experience with the uh, internet, well, internet is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do realize the benefits. Uh, well, I mean, for example, when we compare ourselves with the US civil rights movement. Getting the message across takes so much effort and the internet just made it so much easier for anybody to join the movement and actually get the message across. However, a lot of the times we, uh, uh, especially here in the US media, because Twitter at the end of the day is a US product, they're so happy to say it's a Twitter revolution. Um, Bahrain actually started not on Twitter. Uh, Twitter was not popular at all. Uh, Facebook was a bit more popular. Um, but the true kind of uh, thing that was utilized by people to get the message around were village web forums. Uh, so even before the internet, when mobile phones had SMS, communities in villages, uh, they used to have, everybody had a, who had a mobile phone can sign up to the community village. And it's like, oh, somebody's ill, we can go visit them to the hospital. Oh, this, this person is getting married. This person just had a child. Also included, there's a protest on this road, let's go. Uh, so those kind of methods were instantly picked up. Um, what Twitter and Facebook did was suddenly it gave us access to international journalists. International journalists were the biggest marketers for Twitter for us. I, I mean, for me, I only joined Twitter not because I wanted to discuss my opinion, blah, blah, blah. I still believe in what uh, Kasparis was saying, is that for real movements, you need real interaction. You need people. The, the bulk of the movement in Bahrain comes out from a protest after going to prayers in the mosque, just like uh, the civil rights movement. It was all ch the black churches. They come, they sing hymns inside the church, and then they go out in the street and they sing songs about you know, demanding their rights. It was the same in Bahrain, where our songs and traditions, you know, our marches, we have religious processions during you know, religious occasions. It's the same thing, a big bunch of people marching on. One time they're chanting religious slogans, the next time uh, you know, they're chanting about you know, their freedoms and release of prisoners. So that was the bulk of the movement. It's actually people-oriented, based inside communities. However, the internet, Twitter, suddenly, when it was just us, us and the government, it became us, the world, which was accessed by Twitter and the government. And it was a big tool. But at the same time, there were disadvantages. So the government used Twitter when it used to be, they used to force small children by sexually assaulting them or you know, uh, threatening them or you know, paying some people inside the communities to become informers. Twitter gave them a new platform to spy on you know, activists. So they hired a lot of Western, and this is one of the stuff that we were doing in Bahrain Watch, where they you know, spent uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of dollars you know, on software to basically spy on activists through this media. They used to send like small links uh, from fake accounts that looked like revolutionary accounts. Oh, open this report about this human rights violation. And when you click on it, it actually 
uh, sends your IP address back to the ISP inside Bahrain, and then they can identify who you are. And actually, we have about six, uh, six Twitter users right now uh, serving about a year, uh, a year sentence for insulting the king over Twitter. Um, and actually, yeah, just yesterday, uh, we had Twitter and Facebook for the past year you know, for insults to the king. And in fact, the, in the Bahrain Penal Code, if you insult the king, the flag, the army, the police, the parliament, all of those are in the penal code if you insult them, and insult is a vague word anyway. Over Twitter, you basically you know, get uh, punished by you know, up to five years sentence. Yesterday, one was being charged with uh, uh, insulting the king over Instagram. So welcome Instagram to the club. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just a very quick addition to what's already been said. Um, I guess one thing to think about in terms of young people and activism, especially with many of them being students, is to think about how they can connect it um, between en engagement and action with some type of a research initiative so that they do think about the history, so they do begin to make a connection to the context that they're working within. I think one quick example that I, I love to share this one is that there's many folks within the sports world, even current athletes, that say they want to be like Muhammad Ali you know, they, they're all about Muhammad Ali, they know everything about Muhammad Ali, you know, they're gonna be just like what he did. But if you really talk to them, they don't, they don't actually, they don't know his history. They don't know any of the, the movements or the poetry or any of the, the stories or, or the way that he really changed the world. And so and sometimes um, activists, you kind of looking at how they're, what knowledge base they're working off of and in what ways are they sort of co-opting activists, you know, they're saying, I'm gonna, use this name of Muhammad Ali, but to what extent are they really kind of deeper in their, in their commitment? Um, Taylor, could you also address this issue? Because uh, I think there's a, a sense out there that people in the civil rights movement just suddenly, like Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. suddenly wouldn't, get, wouldn't move from that bus. But in fact, that's not quite true. Yeah, it's really fun for me to be up here with these uh, young people. I think they're doing such a great job. Uh, I, I would say uh, to, the, to the young lawyer that my chief lesson from the civil rights movement is that you need to emphasize asking questions and getting outside yourself a little bit more. Yes, it's about putting your views out there, but what makes a movement grow is a sense of discovery, and you can't have a sense of discovery without a sense of surprise and a little bit of risk. So one of my favorite people from the civil rights era, Diane Nash, who's actually going to be here next week, uh, likened the move, every day in the movement to her wedding day in this sense that her knees were always shaking and she knew she was taking a leap in the unknown um, and it, that it was going to profine, profoundly define her, but she's getting outside herself. And when you discover, if you ask questions, Movements rise on questions, people, that if you find out somebody else is asking the same questions. So when I teach the civil rights movement, I ask students to do something beyond their comfort zone and experience and then come back and tell the other students about it because I think that shared experience creates a sense of movement. Uh, go into a church from a different tradition. Um, uh, college students spending the night in a homeless shelter. Uh, a the basket, a forward on the basketball team went to a Friday night service at an Orthodox synagogue and came back and talked about what he learned and how he was treated. That's kind of a movement experience. And if I'm not saying that for all of these movements, but it, 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 it's kind of the routine to, to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and asking questions where you don't know what the answer is going to be. Because if you just preach to the choir, you, the movement's not going to grow. Okay, I, I'd add one other thing. We have Mina Kiai here. He was, he's, he's from Kenya. Wave. There he is. Um, so he's a community, or he was uh, the leading, one of the leading human rights lawyers in Kenya. And he is now a community organizer there because he thinks that the, the way to really create change is going in, go into communities and not tell them what they should be doing, but ask them what they want. You know, what are your priorities? Is it education? Is it health care? Is it the right to vote? What do you want? And then get people to work together to come together and demand change on the issues that they identify as important, not that, you know, you identify as important. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted <laughs> and to we respond. Have to get into another question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> on how did the civil rights movement as well inspired? Is at that time you didn't know where to go. It's like every single step was uh, was going to something unknown. For us, is we know because we see. It's like you have achieved rights, you have achieved equality. So this is. We can, we can get there as well. At, le at that time, you did not know what's going to happen. For us, we know that the change is going to be over there. So that is kind of gives us an inspiration to move forward because we see the light over there, whether it's going to be tomorrow or after 10 years, but there is going to be. Very good. That's the optimism you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Can Um, we, uh, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, this was a very uh, interesting discussion. One of the issues that I find working in Egypt is the generational divide, and specifically talking about um, issues of uh, um, nonviolence. Uh, the younger generation, and I'm not talking about my age, I'm talking about really the younger generation, have compl we've completely lost control of them um, because they're so angry at some of the violence coming from the police. And, um, and so in reaction to that, after seeing uh, um, you know, their friends die on the front lines, uh, uh, eyes being lost, their natural reaction is to go out and uh, when you see a police officer react very violently to that. Uh, it's an emotional, visceral reaction. Uh, with the internet, um, one of the issues with it, well, I think it's a it's a huge uh, opportunity for us to engage. It's also a huge opportunity for them to organize outside of institutions that teach nonviolence or advocate for nonviolence, or even individuals that advocate for nonviolence. So I'm wondering, across this generational divide, looking at some of these issues, how do you connect um, sort of being leaders, or let's say grass top leaders, how do you connect the older generation and the, in and the um, experiences they've had with the younger generation that we're looking to um, build uh, into the next generation and to be lead the movement after us? How do you make that connection? And um, specifically, uh, I'd like to also hear how it happened in the civil rights movement. Um, but I think each of these contexts would be very interesting. Yeah, I guess for me, I feel that it's a really important um, issue. Um, and as I relate it to my own work and, you know, kind of my commitment around sports and human rights and civil rights, um, I guess for me, I've, I've really put a strong emphasis on discovery and on kind of understanding the history and finding those people that were pioneering these kinds of ideas before and, been, and were thinking about how to make these breakthroughs and how to think about the connection of sport and human rights and inclusion and disability rights and trying to get those folks that may have been lost over time and actually give them a chance to um, have, a, have a stage or have a voice for young people. Um, each year I organize an event at the Muhammad Ali Center for, um, for young people that are interested in engaging around these issues of sport and athletes and human rights. And I, the main goal of it is to try to do that in the transfer of history and the transfer of knowledge and, and learn, thinking about the different strategies and approaches and, and how young people can really think about their own leadership potential and their own innovation. You know, I feel like, especially at, in this generation, there's a big, there's a, a lot of interest and commitment around social innovation and social entrepreneurship. And so young people are oftentimes thinking about that they're the first person to ever come up with this idea. And so it, and sometimes it, for them to sit down and just take a moment to actually realize that there's been, there's been history, waves and waves of people that have come before, and to really take the time to know those folks. And sometimes they may, you know, um, those become really important friendships, and, and we talked about mentorship, and, and so I, I feel like building those bridges is very important. It's okay, I have the microphone. <laughs> um, well, I have the same question. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to answer because when, in, in our experience in Bahrain, when we look at the, diff the different way of thinking between the generations, um, I can like talk with my own family. When I was a kid, um, 
you know, 12, 13, looking at the things that were happening. And, you know, over, uh, over like, Friday is when, like, the whole family, like, loads of cousins and aunts, you know, all gather at my uh, grandma's house. And as soon as I just, like, you know, say, criticize the government, my grandpa would say, shush, the walls have ears. So that's it. Like, you know, look, it's, uh, they're stronger than us, then just accept it and shut up. Um, so that was like his generation, and then you see my father's generation, where he was very much politically aware. Uh, he wasn't like sh straight away, uh, you know, active in it. But I still remember, for example, he uh, he was given an award uh, for his um, achievements, you know, and, uh, after getting his bachelor's degree. In those days, there weren't that many, uh, so he did uh, he did a lot of achievements, and he was going to give an award by the prime minister. Our prime minister is the same prime minister since 71, so it's been like 42 years now, the same prime minister, who is the root of a lot of problems in the country. And I remember him, uh, so he, he was going to be given the award on TV, and everybody in the family, go, go, you're going to put on TV. In those days, being on TV was like so cool. And he said, no, I will never shake my hands with this guy. For me, that was my first actual understanding, because I was a kid, of what's going on in the country. Because, you know, it, it wasn't taught in history. There's no books. There's no communication. So it's like, oh, there's something wrong going on here. So his kind of, you know, form of protest was basically cutting off, not even accepting, you know, uh, uh, shaking hands with the prime minister. When I graduated, I went and shook hands with the prime minister. In, the, in, the, in those days, this was the beginning of 2000, when the promises of reform and optimism uh, in Bahrain, when the king promised reform, 98% of the people went and voted for reform. They accepted. When he gave a good gesture and said, you know, we have 3,000 political prisoners, I'll release them, and I'll give you the parliament back. Everybody was happy, even though we had martyrs. We were killed and imprisoned and tortured. We said, we'll give it a chance. We'll give it a chance, even though he gave impunity to torturers. People said, we'll give it a chance. And nobody said that it was rigged or anything. Everybody, 98.4%, voted for change. And we have had our first independent newspaper, so things seemed optimistic. It didn't last more than two, three years, and things started rolling back, and then it exploded in 2011. But when, it look, when you look at generations, one of the things that I'm always concerned about is their understanding of democracy. It's the older generation thinks about power, basically. We need power. Whereas the younger generation thinks more about inclusiveness. Uh, so uh, it's sometimes hard to like, talk about you know, trying to build a society where even those who, were, who committed violations or, you know, for example, loyalists to the regime in, in Bahrain, uh, because this monarchy is Sunni, m most of the Sunni community has allied itself with the government. Not because they love the monarchy, uh, some of them are loyal, but because they don't see any other choice for them. Uh, they, they are very fearful and they don't trust to kind of ally themselves with the, with, the, with the opposition. However, you see that their young generation, their old generation has complete loyalty. The young generation after the government utilized the sectarian divide and put the Sunni community against the Shia community, their young generation splintered out. They created their own organizations for the first time. They created their own organizations, which are critical of the government, but not allied with the opposition. So you can see that there's a generational shift even amongst them. And maybe one day, and this is what I hope, is that the youth from all these <laughs> sides actually have an understanding because it uh, you know, these events are a crash course in history. We start reading about Martin Luther King, we say South <coughs> Africa, Northern Ireland, you know, and all the other movements in this very small time because we want to build our country. And we can see the difference when we talk to the older generation. They don't get everything we say. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. We just, uh, we're actually a little bit past the end, but uh, I'd love to, to hear any comments here. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I think I'm be, I will be very short about how we can connect. Is, um, I wrote down it's storytelling. It's we, we have to tell the stories to people too. And um, 
and how we connect, because we see as well, young people are becoming more violent as well in Latvia when they look back in the history and they live the history. What we say is like, you stop living in a history, make your own history, but don't forget what was uh, done previously. So this is like, we have to tell their stories, but uh, we have to inspire them to do non-violent actions because sometimes they, they, they read the history and they want to live back, but it's, they have to make their own. And uh, because what, what you were saying about walls have uh, ears is like, we, we still have that. <laughs> we have the most famous saying, this is not a phone conversation. It's, <laughs> Uh, because yeah, every, so so yeah, it's like I think I yeah I think it's like, and as well we we need to cooperate uh, together all the generations. So that's going to be that's how we're going to learn from each other because older generation has actually a lot to learn from the younger one as well. <laughs> oh, I just spoken as a young man. Yeah. yeah by <laughs> by the way, it, one of the coolest things about Bahrain, the photogenics <clears throat> are the best when we have like old people in our protests. Yeah, journalists love it. And there's, if you go on the internet, you'll see loads. So we have like babies to like old people all coming in the protest. And they're the best, you know, to represent the protest, you know, when the, you get there. They don't need to discuss philosophies or whatever, but when they're in the protest, we need their, pictures. Their, their, hearts are, their hearts are in it. You know, when they say something, it's really much more profound when I say something or anybody else. Um, well, we, we're, we started with the civil rights movement, so let's end with it. <laughs> I would just say it from the, the lesson of the civil rights movement was that there was always really profound tension between the older generation and the young generation, except when they ignored each other, um, <laughs> which is a common thing. You'd be surprised how many people I interviewed told me that when they were growing up in Mississippi that their parents told them never to mention Emmett Till and what happened to him in their household. Why? Because it was fearful. And to the older people, to some degree, it was embarrassing that, that their lives were, that they were treated like cattle, and that, so they didn't want to talk about it. Well, then the kids can't get the history because they don't get it through their umbilical cord. They got to get it from somewhere. They got to ask questions. So when older generations and younger generations did have tension, it was because they were asking questions of each other and colliding with each other, and that was very creative. So um, one of the first people that you should be asking uh, questions of and reaching out is somebody from a different age group. Well, thank you all very much for this incredibly inspiring uh, panel, really interesting from very, very different worlds, but all working for, um, for, for justice. And uh, a special thanks for, to Taylor for letting us grab you and, and come on up here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.